Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. We're glad to see you today. We hope that you have a wonderful and safe week. This week's a little bit unusual that our live stream is being done in a mostly empty sanctuary. Our council has made the decision to suspend in-person worship during this spike of the coronavirus, but we hope that you will continue to join us for worship either on Sunday mornings at 9.30 or throughout the week. Let us now make an act of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved. Holy One, we confess that we are not awake for you. We are not faithful in using your gifts. We forget the least of our sins. We do not see your beautiful image in one another. We are infected by sin that divides our beloved community. Open our hearts to your God. Open our eyes to see you in our neighbor. Open our hands to serve your creation. Beloved, we are God's children, and Jesus, our beloved, opens the door to us. Through Jesus, you are forgiven. By Jesus, you are welcome. In Jesus, you are called to rejoice. Let us live in the promises prepared for us from the foundation of the world. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth.
Righteous God, our merciful Master, you own the earth and all its peoples, and you give us all that we have. Inspire us to serve you with justice and wisdom, and prepare us for the joy of the day of your coming, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Today's psalm is Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. Before, Before the mountains were brought forth, or the land and earth were born, from the age of age you are God. You turn us back to the dust and say, Turn back, O children of earth. For a thousand, thousand years in your sight are like yesterday is in the past, and like the watch on the night. You sweep them away like a dream. They fade away suddenly like the grass. In the morning it is green and flourishes. In the evening it is dry up and withered. For we are consumed by your anger. We are afraid because of your wrath. Our iniquities you have set them before you, and our secret sins in the light of your countenance. When you are angry, all our days are gone. We bring our years to an end, like a sigh. The span of our, our life is seventy years, perhaps a strength even eighty. Yet, yet, yet the son of man is on the day of the sorrow, for they pass away as quickly, and we are gone. Who regards the power of your wrath? 
Who rightly fears your indignation? So teach us to number our days that we may be applied our hearts to wisdom. To you, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light and children of day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep at night and those who are drunk get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober. And put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet of hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another, and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. The word of the Lord. Thank you to God. According to Matthew. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them, and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master? You handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave! You knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow, and gather where I did not scatter? And you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Beloved, grace and peace be unto you from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. This is one of the parables I learned as a small child. As a matter of fact, I seem to recall 
writing my gifts and skills on little gold bars and stacking them up. One, two, three, four, five. And then maybe taking one and stuffing it in a bag. Oftentimes, this parable has come to us in such a way that we want to read it very simply. Do good for God. God will do good for you. And if you don't get busy by the time Jesus gets back, look out! Bad things are coming your way. Now, whether we want to take this as a stewardship lesson, or one about our gifts and skills, or one about hiding the gospel and not sharing it with our neighbors, I suppose we can. But I want to draw your attention to the fact that this is not a kingdom parable. This is not a kingdom parable. Indeed, some translations add in the kingdom of heaven's life, but that's not in the original text. No, friends, this parable is a story that Jesus tells to his friends as a part of his final teaching. Before what? Before he goes to face his faith in Jerusalem. And so I think that in all of these parables about the sudden return, Jesus is trying to teach us and his friends about what he was about to do about the action that he was about to take that on its face made no sense. Part of what will help us to understand the context of this is to think about the value of what's at stake. Talents ranged in value from, in modern terms, thirty to $75,000 each. So we're talking an annual salary in every bar. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really know anyone in my personal life who can fling around annual salaries to his friends and say, hey, why don't you invest this and play around with it for me? See what you can do. At the end of the day, though, the kind of money that's being thrown around could really only be used for a few things, including speculating on shipping and farms. Wealthy lenders would pour vast sums into farmers' fields or into sailors' ships with the hopes of returning a humongous gain as they collected their portion of the harvest or their portion of the shipment. Now, in this parable, we hear the third slave say that the master reaps where he does not sow, right? and harvests where he did not scatter any seed. So this master is someone who invests in farms and keeping farmers afloat. And then comes in and says, hey look, magically, here's my corn. Corn that he didn't plant. Or if things went really bad, here's my corn and the title to your farm because you didn't make enough to pay me back this year. This shrewd businessman had made his living off of swallowing up family farms and swallowing up family businesses and making them part of his larger and larger estate. So much so that he could then turn around and hire managers and give those managers vast sums of money and say, do what I have done. Which means that all three of those slaves were expected to go out, invest in farmers, and if it didn't turn out, to seize their farms and all of the proceeds with it. So it turns out that when that's the kind of master that you have, and those are the kind of values that you live into, you can get good at it. Especially if you've been given the upper hand of being given the most to begin with. Turning five into five more, or two into two more, Except, there's this one slave who does something completely different. He says no. Now, he doesn't steal the money. He doesn't waste the money. He doesn't give it away. 
He actually doesn't do anything to his master's money at all. He hides it away in a hole, knowing that at the very least he can give it back having not lost it. He believes that his master is harsh and terrible. And in exchange for this lack of business acumen, in exchange for this strange rebellion where he refuses to do simply what his master said just because, and in this refusal to take advantage of his neighbors and their families and their generational family farms, he is thrown out, tossed away, put into the outer darkness. Now, it's very easy for us as Christians to spiritualize this concept of outer darkness as being something like hell. But actually, it's a real place. The outer darkness refers to the place beyond the city wall, where in times of great trouble, those who had access, those who had friends, and those who had property inside the city could be inside the walls when the gates were shut, the windows were closed, and the ramparts were filled with soldiers. And they maybe, maybe stood a chance of surviving if enemies came knocking on the front door. But in the outer darkness, the little villages, the tiny farms, the hills around the city exposed with no cover and no protection, the people who lived in those places knew again and again and again that when trouble came knocking, no one was coming. And that when enemies were going to march on the city, no one was going to welcome them in. And that when trouble was swallowing up the nation, they were not going to be considered at all. So yes, maybe it is a vision of hell. The kind of hell that some of our neighbors know here on earth. A hell where, no matter how cold it gets tomorrow night, there is no inside to go to. No matter how much someone might want to proclaim it for themselves, they know that at the end of the day, they don't matter. That when it comes down to it, they're not the ones passing out the talents. They're the ones turning over the keys and the title and their heritage and everything. But remember, friends, this parable is a story of Jesus' final teaching before he goes on to make his most significant gift of all. The gift of himself. And what follows this parable is Jesus teaching about what the judgment will be like. Where people who have loved and served and cared for their neighbors, fed them, given them drink, given them clothing, given them shelter, visited them in the most dire of circumstances, have all served God. Friends, the three crosses on the hill are planted squarely in the outer darkness. Beyond the wall, beyond the reach of power, beyond the reach of those who would protect the innocent. And that's where Jesus is headed. Not to some palace, not to some fancy seat to take over as a new Caesar, not to some grand place. Jesus is headed to the outer darkness. And there he finds his throne. There he's coronated. There he's lifted up. There he's made the center of all history. And there he brings life to the world by the giving of his own. Jesus would breathe his last, surrounded by weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so if we, 
on this day as we pray, as we hope for the coming of the Lord, as we prepare to celebrate the reign of Christ over the whole world, if we want to gather at Jesus' throne, if we want to gather at his feet and there pray and there cry out with our afflictions, there is nowhere else to go except to the outer darkness. Let us set aside the pursuits that destroy our neighbors. Let us set aside the pursuits that ultimately bring us nothing and instead bring everything to the foot of the cross, outside the walls, outside any earthly protection, outside the reign of any earthly power. And there behold, the infinite love and mercy of God, power made perfect in weakness. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. With the church around the world gathered at the foot of the cross, we profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the
the saints yet to come may also know your love. Hear us, O God. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Until that day when you gather all creation around your throne, we will reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. And if you're watching from home, you can touch each other as you offer a sign of peace. <laughs>
doubter, to the hero and the coward, to the prisoner and the soldier, to the young and to the older, all who hunger, all who thirst, all the last and all the first, all the paupers and the princess, all who fail, you've been forgiven, all who dream and all who suffer, all who Well, hello folks. You may have noticed that we had some audio issues this morning. We actually had an audio cable that pulled loose, but it didn't pull out all of the way. And as a result, we lost some sound during the end part of worship. Still, we hope you enjoyed worshiping with us today. And uh, we wanted to give an announcement about upcoming activities at the church. M tomorrow, Monday night, the November the 16th, we'll be meeting with the council to make determinations about both our weekend worship and all of our other activities through the end of the year. Um, so we'll be putting out a letter this week indicating what the decisions are about all of those activities uh, so that you can plan accordingly. In the meantime, I hope that you'll plan to see us uh, here on Facebook Live or to see us um, on YouTube uh, during the course of the week and that uh, you enjoy worshiping with us. Now bow your hearts to receive God's blessing. May Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and always. Amen. Beloved of God, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.